So um, compaction is a lot with what's going on under the ground. Uh, we got into this back in the early 1980s uh, when we were doing no-till and we found that uh, under no-till, the biggest problem was seven inches down. It was like a row bed from the compaction from the moldboard plowing. Uh, as uh, we open uh, the, gen uh, the genetics to a higher yield, we run into soil management, determining just how much we're gonna get out of those genetics. You need to have a soil structure that will support it, a soil health that will support it. What happens to the soil? First of all, there are fragile soils like uh, here in Tennessee, a very low organic matter. Uh, there are a fine silty loam that falls apart and makes a road real, bit, real easy. Yet at the same time, uh, we had the same conditions in New York, but it was for different regions. First of all, excess tire pressure. Uh, they put 100 PSI in a, a manure tire and drive on the field. That does incredible compaction on the top layers. But the biggest issue is excess axle loads, uh, anything more than five tons. There are farm equipment and farm machinery that is illegal to run on the highways because they weigh too much. They do not have enough axles on them. Uh, thank goodness the state police haven't started weighing some of these tractors and some of the equipment they're bringing over the road. But the axle loads will do serious damage to roads and incredible permanent damage to your fields. Uh, tillage at the wrong time and type. As the farms get bigger, they got to get this done. So we're going to go out there. And yeah, there's a little wet spot in the field. Uh, we'll get through that. We got a big enough tractor. We've got duels on. We'll get through it. And then the next year, the wet spot gets a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. And as they found up in Canada, instead of tiling on 50 foot spacing, they were down to 25 foot spacing because they had pounded the soil so hard, uh, it is no longer allowing water to move in and out. Monoculture uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, this idea is we can grow corn after corn after corn. That's fine. It's not going to, we've got everything we can make it work. Uh, they never ask the soil about it. Uh, row crops like that do an incredible job deteriorating the soil health and structure and then adding insult to injury. And Rodale found this on their farm. Soils bear over the winter really collapse in soil health and they collapse in soil structure. So over the winter, all those bare cornfields you see out there are going downhill at a tremendous rate and doing a lot of damage to uh, the, the health and structure of that field. We have various soils, anywhere from very well-drained, moderately well-drained, poor and somewhat poorly drained fields. Uh, as we go over with this, all this equipment that I just went through, this is what happens. We take every one of those so soils and we compact them. Uh, I ran a research farm that had 67 feet of sand and gravel. And the roots only went down seven inches because the pieces fit together that if you plowed it at the wrong time or drove on it with the wrong equipment, put a compacted zone in at seven or eight inches and no roots went below that, even though we could have rooted 67 feet down. And that was a well-drained soil. So all of these soils can suffer from compaction. Just stepping back a minute, looking at the field. Um, when we have uh, a, a field that is saturated, and that's on the upper left up here, a saturated, let me back up, uh, saturated soil, uh, the water's going to run through. All the pore space is occupied by water. Uh, when it's at field capacity, we're at the next level where uh, there's about half the pores are air, half the pores are water. Uh, the air is critical for root growth. And so uh, that's about where we want to be and how much of that space is available depends on soil compaction and your management. As the soil dries out, it gets down to where it's wilting point. Uh, you have a little bit of water 
but uh, basically most of the soil pores are now air. There isn't water to grow the crop. Looking at a sand, a well-structured loam, and then a, a silty clay. As we increase the water in the field, we have the unavailable water. That's the stuff that's held very tightly in the soil or positionally unavailable. Then we have the well-drained plant available water. That's the water that you can grow your crop on. And that's why sand soils tend to be droughty if they don't have a lot of plant available water. Uh, clay soil can be droughty. It has quite a bit of plant available water, but what you did to that field can have a huge difference. Uh, that's the wilting point and field capacity. And then the gravitational water is that excess water that runs out of the field uh, runs into the deeper uh, water layer, uh, deeper layers, uh, and into the water table. Okay, Tom, I need to interrupt you for a second. I think we're still having problems here again. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Looking at a well structured soil versus a uh, compacted soil, uh, field capacity is right up to the point of how much water is available for that crop uh, to grow. When you come in and you put compaction in, two things happen. Root resistance, the roots can't grow to get to the water. And then the positional unavailable water, uh, the, they can't reach water uh, that may be available. A classic example I had of this was a bottom land field. We were doing, tried some deep tillage in a few spots and we chisel plowed. This was a gravel soil. We went out there in the summertime and you could go to the row. The taller corn was the stuff that had well-structured deep rooting. The stuff that was shorter was shallower. So we dug in the deeper layers. We went down 17 inches. The gravel was dry all the way down 17 inches uh, because it had pulled all that water out. We went over to the chisel plowed ground. We, drove, we dug down five inches. That's where the roots stopped. We dug through a compacted layer that was two inches thick. And underneath that, we had liquid water on the gravel that the crop could have used, but could not get to it because of positional unavailability. Uh, the roots could not reach that stuff. And so that is where your yield gain comes from by increasing your rooting depth and making your soil more structured and taking the compacted layers out. Now there is a feeling that, all right, compaction, it affects corn crops, it affects soybeans, and it may affect vegetables, but really uh, it doesn't do anything for hay because the hay grows year around uh, and uh, it'll go down through it all. BS, bad science. Uh, this is a study done on clay. And if you look at the medium compacted layer, you're looking at uh, 50 to 60% of yield potential 40 to 50% was lost, both with the grasses and with the alfalfa because of compaction. Now there is this thought that uh, sand soils don't compact, not true. Uh, this is a sand soil at medium compaction, we've lost 30% of the yield potential of that field. I saw a classic example of this. We were doing work with no-till farmer, <coughs> excuse me, had no-till this gravel soil for 10 years. He had three or four years of corn and then four or five years of hay and enough a couple of years of corn and then went back into hay again. Uh, we dug down and every alfalfa plant went seven inches and then the root looked like a pig's tail. It was a spiral and it did not go anywhere simply because compaction in the gravel soil kept that of those roots from going deeper. The sand soil on the research farm I ran uh, was compacted. It compacts very well. Uh, we did some work in Saratoga County uh, on some pure sand fields. We had deep tilled them, then we moldboarded them once, came back in and grew the corn and no roots went below seven inches. They stopped. Even though underneath there, I could push my hand into the profile up to my elbow. It was so soft and mellow, but none of those roots went through because of compaction. 
This is a field where we were doing some work uh, on um, uh, looking at uh, compaction and some of the options. Um, this is a, on the left is a, right here is a computerized soil compaction analyzer, otherwise known as a shovel. Uh, you go out, you stick the shovel in the ground. Everything has to be computerized. That's why I said that. Uh, you go out, you stick the shovel in the ground. The first thing you find out is that you hit a rock at seven inches all over the field, even though there's no rocks in the field. That's the compacted layer. And in this case, we pushed the shovel in the ground, popped it back again, uh, and out came this mass of roots. And this flat was as exactly how it came out of the ground. That was a disc pan. There were few, if any, roots below that. Uh, it was severely compacted. He was growing his crop on four inches. That was all. This was another field that traditionally had been moldboard plowed and disc, and then they switched over to chisel plowing and disking, and the roots went down four or five inches, and then you had this uh, blocky layer underneath. Uh, this was on a creek bottom area, so it was a well-drained soil, but the roots did not go down through that simply because of the compaction. This is some of the work that I was doing on a, on a field uh, at uh, the research farm that was well drained. Uh, the roots went down six inches and you could see all the roots turned and went sideways. And there was debris there from the previous crop plowed down that hadn't decayed because this whole bottom layer was anaerobic in the compacted soil and the perched water table that then formed on it on a well drained gravelly soil. So it will affect all the soils. So our soil as we're, is made up is mostly uh, uh, minerals and organic matter. The organic matter we do control and try to increase. Uh, that organic matter plays a big role, uh, but the air and the water makes up most of the pore space. Uh, that's where uh, water can move through, roots can go through, uh, and get the water uh, for the crop. Now in a compacted soil, the pore space has been decreased. It's been smashed, it's been crushed. Uh, and so there's less space there. And with less space, there's less air in the soil. Uh, usually there is less organic matter in those soils also. And more of the space is taken up by water, which makes it anaerobic. And an anaerobic field is not going to grow most of our forage crops. The pore space has been decreased. As you decrease the pore space, two things happen. First of all, the roots can't get through the holes. These are uh, various pressures that were applied and how much root elongation went on depending on the compacted layers the roots get shorter and shorter. They can't fit through the hole because it's too small and they can't push into the soil because it's too hard. Now, a soil that uh, a tree root, where it can't get through a sidewalk, but it can break the sidewalk up if it finds a crack to get through. Uh, and it's the same way out there. But as it breaks up that uh, little hole to make it a little bigger, uh, it uses a tremendous amount of energy to do that, and that reduces yield. And it also reduces the amount of growth those roots can make. And so you can see as the compaction got higher and higher, the root growth in the field got shorter and shorter. And that's why we have yield limits is the roots can't get the water, can't get the nutrients to maximize what they're doing. When you look at a sandy soil and a clay soil, the native soils have tremendous infiltration rate. But as soon as you compact them, the infiltration rate drops off significantly. This does two things. First of all, it robs you of the water that you were gonna to use to grow the crop. It ran off the field. Secondly, because it ran off the field, it's eroding the field. It's taken soil particles, usually the most fertile parts with them first and leaving the stones and the junk behind. But simply because of the compaction, you have limited the amount of water that is gonna be there to grow your crop. 
So there are major factors here. One of them is raindrop impact. And that's why I think this talk does still fit in very well with what uh, Kirsten was saying before, is what you're doing on that top couple of inches is critical. If we can intercept that raindrop impact, we can stop the soil crusting. If you don't, they're like little bombs that go off. They explode the surface of the soil, drive the soil particles horizontal, and then the next thing you know, your soil surface is like a linoleum floor. It's been sealed right over, air can't go in, water can't go in. Uh, the residue that they were leaving on the soil interferes with that raindrop impact, and so breaks up that force before it hits the ground, so it prevents it from sealing over with surface crusted. Tillage operations do the next layer. If you're plowing this thing, Oh, shit. Sorry. There. I don't know why that happened. You there? Sorry We're back that. in business? Sorry about that. Okay. Oh. All right. Uh, continuous plowing or disking at the same point makes tillage pans. We're going to take a look at some of those. They are just under the area where you were doing tillage. And then wheel traffic. That is the major portion. These tractors weigh a lot. The equipment weighs a lot. And the bigger they are, the worse they are. And one of the pieces I've just come up with recently uh, is this, and they had this in one of our, uh, the CCA magazines is uh, compaction from vertical tillage. People are going in with these vertical tillage units. They think they can drive on them anytime on the field, but all that weight is on a real thin little piece and they're getting incredible, incredible compaction uh, from that. So the bigger the tractors, the more acres, the less time they have to get stuff done, the more likely they're gonna drive out there when they shouldn't be on wet soils. And then I'll talk about this more this afternoon, crop rotation. Crop rotation can have a huge effect here, helping or hurting this. If you're doing the same crop over and over again, uh, like a row crop, uh, the soil structure, the soil health uh, goes down and the compaction increases. So our compaction is a couple different layers. There's a surface crust. That's what I just talked about from the raindrop impact. Uh, that seals it over like a linoleum floor. It may only be a quarter of an inch thick, but no water or air can get through. Uh, the next one is the surface compaction. Uh, this is especially under wheels. If you're more than 15 PSI in your tire, you are doing surface compaction. And then there's the tillage pan, which is just under the plowing or chisel plowing depth. Uh, that's where it's packed down, the two inches under that. And then the deep or subsoil compaction, uh, that is from running two heavy axle loads over the ground uh, and putting compaction uh, into that soil. Uh, this was some work in Pennsylvania. Uh, where they were looking at the pan and the pan was between eight to 12 inches is where most of the pan was. And it was in the corn field and it was in the alfalfa field. The alfalfa cannot grow through it. Remember three slides back, my pictures of those root growths that were shorter and shorter and shorter because they couldn't get through. The same thing happens with alfalfa. It can't penetrate through. And so the roots are gonna be shorter because of the compaction put in by tillage. Now, if your soil is dry, you have less compaction, you still have some. The first pass over does most of the damage. Uh, under optimal soil moisture, uh, you do have some compaction, uh, but uh, it's uh, not as bad as the wet. And that's where people get into trouble. There's a little wet spot there. We're gonna go through it anyway. We have a big enough tractor. We put enough tires on, we're fine. We're running 20 tons per axle load. And so not only are you getting surface compaction from the 40 PSI and the tires, but then we're getting axle compaction deeper into the soil that is never going to go away. And here is that picture right there. Uh, compaction on the top, is due to the pressure in the tire. 
and 100 PSI is typical what they put on manure spreaders. <coughs> the upper subsoil is pressure from the tires and your axle load. And then these deep layers here are the axle load. Looking at this closer, uh, this is depth of compaction from the same tire, the same pressure, but wetter soils. As the soils get wetter, the compaction goes deeper. Yes, you got through the field, but at what price for the next 10, 15 years on yield coming off of those fields? And then as we uh, add to the axle load, as the axle load goes up, the pressure goes further and further into the ground. Uh, anything more than five tons axle load increases the depth that that compaction uh, is going. And that is permanent yield loss. And then finally, the tire itself. Uh, they have moved more away from the biased tires, more to the radials. Some people rather buy the cheaper tire, but the cheaper tire has a smaller footprint, puts more pressure on the soil, and so your compaction goes deeper. Whereas a radial tire is going to spread out and have more surfaces it covers, so it reduces the compaction uh, especially on the surface layers. And here's where they drove over to the, over a board. On the left is 40 PSI, on the right is 18 PSI. You can see the huge difference in the amount of uh, area that is being compacted. This 40 PSI is packing pretty good under that area. Whereas here with the 18 PSI, uh, it's a shallower compaction. The other thing, this comes back into what Kirsten was saying earlier of having crops growing on the ground. If there's a live root there, when you drive on the surface, as long as you don't pack it too much, the root can push that surface stuff back apart again, if it's a live root. If it's a dead root, it smashes and you're done for. Uh, so having living stuff on your soil all the time is getting to be more and more understood as a critical piece. All right, all tire pressure should be less than 15 PSI. That is critical. Uh, these are 100 PSI tires. Underneath that, uh, each tire there uh, is a compressor unit. This was work that was done up in, in Canada. They had an excellent thing on compaction. And you could see the compression just spike incredibly high. Uh, one of the interesting things they have, and I was talking to a farmer uh, two days ago up in uh, 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 Wisconsin, he has this on his track. What you are looking at is an air compressor tube that goes to the front of the tractor. He has an air compressor marked on the tractor. As they pull into the field, they're running across the road at 30, 35 PSI. They pull into the field, they turn it to 15 PSI. It lets the air out of the tire it increases the amount of tire that is contacting the ground, spreads that weight over a much, much broader area compared to the little bit of an area that you have here that is being severely compacted. This is spread out. This is not going to do excessive damage on the surface. Sprayers, I see these guys running up and down the road. This is going to tick off any of the sprayer people. But these sprayers, this tire does a huge amount of damage. They're narrow tires. They're high pressure. They cause permanent compaction. When they pull into the field, they want to get done. So they're going to drive through the field, come heck or high water, and they will make it through. But then you pay for that for the next 20 years from the compaction that is going in versus a broader tire. Uh, that has lower PSI because they adjust the PSI. When they pull off the road, they drop the PSI and then drive across the field. Equipment that we don't usually think of as compacting. This is a hay wagon. Remember I said maximum five ton axle load. This had 16 ton on each axle. And we don't think anything of driving across with a hay wagon. A hay wagon and heavily loaded pickup trucks are some of the worst compactors that are there. When you look at uh, the various equipment that is out there, how much is in it, uh, the axle loads. 
anything more than five ton is over what you want to have because it's doing deep compaction. These grade carts with single axles are some of the most horrific compacting ones, and they're not very far behind the manure spreaders uh, or big combines uh, that are coming along behind you. Uh, any one of those can do serious, serious damage in the field. How long does it take and how long to recover? It only takes seconds to compact. It takes many years to recover. If you're doing topsoil compaction, you're knocking the yield down 15%, but over the years, you can work that out. If you're doing compaction in the upper part of the subsoil, this is beginning of the plow pan, then that's gonna take 10 years for that to get worked out unless you do something to the field to remove it. And if you're doing lower subsoil compaction because you're running too big of equipment over the field, you are permanently damaging those fields. We have not come up with a practical way uh, or economical way of removing compaction at 20 to 24 inches. But that is putting a water table in there, uh, cutting the air off, limiting your root growth. Remember alfalfa can go down six, eight feet with no trouble. A lot of plants can go that depth if they can get through the ground. Now an old farmer's tale is that freezing and thawing removes the compaction. It does not. That is BS, bad science. Uh, it needs to be removed. This was a field that was 15 years of alfalfa grass. And we went in and we ran a deep unit in it. When we first ran it, we ran it too shallow. We lifted the surface up, dug a hole down in there and found severe compaction at seven inches, six inches. The irony was is we also found the plow pan from the three bottom plow 15 years before that had added to that compaction and no root went below five inches. Now the initial reaction for farmers is when we find this out, now we gotta go do something about it. Uh, I was working with a farmer where I was trying to convince him that he had compaction on his, on his farm. He wasn't interested in looking. We went out, I finally convinced him to go to the field outside of uh, his kitchen door uh, and take a look. So we took a look, this was 9.30 in the morning. He did not wanna spend any time looking at compaction. We went out to that field, we dug a hole. At 5.30, I said, I have to get back home. My wife's not home yet. I gotta make the dinner for the kids. I gotta leave. One more field, one more field. He said that was the most educational thing he had ever done on his farm is take a shovel and dig a hole and see what's going on under his fields. And then he added the ultimate compliment. He said, I learned more today digging holes with you than I did going to all your meetings. So I'll take that as a compliment. In New Zealand, they say as if deep tillage without a change in the rest of the planting system is a waste of time. Uh, I'm working with a farm up in New York who is uh, making changes. Uh, they were using uh, a surface, uh, um, a vertical till unit for a couple of years in a row. Uh, I had a, a research trial there. I went out in July, grabbed the hold of the plant, popped it out of the ground. Every root was only going in about two inches and it had a little doily of root system and his corn crop looked the same. He had severe compaction. Uh, they bought an underfur deep till unit. Uh, they drove into the field, put it down, started going straight across the field and broke some of the legs off. That's how compacted their soil is. So what he said is this is a work in progress. We now know we have a problem. We now know we need to figure out the best cropping system for our soils. And it is a cropping system using pieces like what Kirsten was talking about earlier, using, uh, and I'll talk about this more this afternoon, using rotations and, and keeping something on the ground. It's a systems approach. And that's what they said in New Zealand. It's a systems approach. You go in and you go and rip this up. Um, quick question, Aaron, um, we got a little late. 
Uh, I think I can do it by 11.15, is that okay? Uh, yep, that works. All right, I'll try to make it through by then because uh, we're a little late. All right, you go in, into that brown and it's all compacted. Uh, then you go and you loosen it all up. We'll take a book, hold it up in the air and let it go. What happens? It falls down again. You loosen that soil up, if nothing's to hold it, just under gravity, it's going to start to compress. But then when you drive over it, you pack the snot back out of it, even worse than before. You have to do this as a system. And a key part of this system is the crops that are growing on it. If you loosen this up, you need to come in and stabilize that soil. Uh, and that's why I'm a big proponent of doing this just before planting a winter forage or just before planting a hay crop. So we have a mass of roots going down to stabilize that. Even after the plant dies, the organic matter helps that structure and the residue on the surface by going to no-till afterwards protects that soil surface from being pounded over. Uh, this is a field where we did exactly that. We had a rooting depth of five inches before that had eight tenths of an inch of water available for the plants. When we broke out the compacted layer, we had three times more yield potential simply because of water availability that was positionally unavailable is available now. A deep till is not magic. You've got to use common sense. Uh, a sand soil has a loose soil and then it's friable and then it has uh, compacted layers uh, in there, that's where it's li liquid. Uh, the soil has too much water. This has just the right amount. And so if you come in at the wrong time, you can end up making a mess out of that field. The soil in this gray area is plastic. It moves around like modeling clay. It doesn't shatter. You need it friable or loose for it to shatter in order to get it to break apart. Uh, the mold board, as you come in, is going to smear a layer underneath. It pushes down and packs it, and then leaves a smeared zone that keeps roots from going through. And that's your compacted layer underneath. Now, just going in and ripping it without looking. Uh, I keep telling the people that sell these deep till units, you need to put a rack on the back of that machine and put a uh, shovel on it. You go in the field, you go 50 feet, you stop and look at what you're doing. Are you doing any good or are you doing damage? But this guy was adding lateral compaction to his horizontal compaction. He went in, sorry, he went in when it was too wet and simply pushed it aside, compacted it sideways in addition to the vertical layers. This was the field uh, that uh, I had told you about before, the 15 years of alfalfa uh, grass. It's an alfalfa grass uh, on a Rhinebeck silty clay loam. This is the compacted layer that was in there. It was just like a road. So we went in with the deep tail unit, uh, blowing smoke, uh, having to drop it down gear. You can see the surface come up in pieces as big as one of the tables you're sitting at and then it would break off and drop down again. Uh, we stopped to look at what we were doing and we found we were only lifting the top soil off of the compacted subsoil. We were doing nothing for the compacted zone underneath, but cutting a groove through the compaction. We were not breaking through. Because we took the shovel and dug the hole and looked, we then went back and we dropped the deep tail unit two inches two inches down, and then we shattered out the whole layer. This is the compacted layer right in here. This is where we were lifting it up. Now we are shattering it out down to 15, uh, 17 inches deep. We are doing some good. Okay, this can help. This can take out the deeper compaction, but you gotta look at the rest of the system. And uh, Kirsten talked about it this morning. I'm gonna talk about it more this afternoon. You can go in and rip it up. This guy's doing a great job of ripping it up. So instead of having compacted layers, he had compacted cement blocks. Every one of these had the hardness of a cement block. It was a god awful mess. And that's way the whole field was. They had beat the snot out of it 
because they were able to get through with this tractor with no problem whatsoever. Uh, and then they thought, well, the deep unit will rip it apart and allow us to get our rooting in there. Uh, it just made bigger lumps. The other thing that happens is people have a chisel plow and they say, well, if I've been chiseling at six inches, if I drop that chisel to eight inches, I could take the compaction out. No, it does not work. And the reason being is A is where the chisel plow was working at its design depth. It's lifting the dirt up. As you drop it down deeper, now instead of lifting it up, you are pushing down, you are pushing forward, and it pushes out to either side. You are compacting the side walls as you're smearing through the soil. It looks great from the traffic, uh, from the tractor seat, but it's you're not doing any good. I thought it's just a bunch of string hair that connected the wheels. Something came in. What's that? Uh, everyone, please mute your mic if you're online. Make sure you're muted. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, and a, a properly designed unit lifts across the whole area. Uh, and this is a nice example of it. Where it's lifting, it lifts it up, it crumbles it. As that gets to be more and more vertical, it ends up pushing ahead and packing. Now, uh, the, uh, we will look at a piece of equipment that does go vertical, but they have a very, very narrow shank with a foot at the bottom uh, that lifts and shatters without doing that. So uh, uh, Kirsten had the other version of this picture taken the other direction. This farmer must be famous. Uh, but this is what we happened. We went into a field, 40 acre field. We took all the compaction out at once uh, and, and the corn was growing great. And then we had an incredible rainstorm and no water ran off, it all ran in. Uh, then the farmer went out there to try to side dress and he got about maybe 50 feet and managed to work out to the edge of the hedgerow and got back out of the field again. There was nothing to drive on. Because of that, we did not want to shatter everything unless we can tiptoe in there and get a winter forage and then a seeding growing afterwards to stabilize those deeper structures. Uh, this is a piece of equipment we have gone to. It has a narrow point in the front here to uh, just move it aside a little bit. Uh, and then uh, the foot lifts up, it pushes it up and shatters it out uh, to either side. Uh, my brother had a unit that had a leg on it that was twice as wide, three times as wide as this. And the problem he ran into is as he went through the field, it packed the sidewall so much that when he came back with the corn planter, he was dropping his corn 17 inches down in the ground. It was just a huge slit that was not crumbling, it was packing. So uh, you need a narrow shank with a foot, no wings. Do not use wings on your unit. Uh, we ran a unit in, uh, in Western New York. Uh, I was working with one of the guys out there. We dug a hole afterward. He was excited. Oh, look at this. This is all crumbled up really nice. I got the shovel out. I dug a hole. And underneath, we had a foot and a half wide road wherever that thing had gone. Just like a moldboard plow, it had smeared and compacted the layer underneath horrifically. So he decided, I guess we take the wings off. So we do not want wings running underground because of the damage. Uh, this is that unit uh, in work where they're going through. Uh, they work up a narrow zone, but it leaves a, a layer in between that is not loosened. It gives you something to drive on. And that gets to be real important uh, when you're doing, in this case, row crops. But he's making one pass across the field and the corn planter literally follows him around the field because it's ready to go. If the deeper layers are not wet. If the deeper layers are wet, uh, then, back here. If the deeper layers are wet, then you need to raise that up to where you are doing some good or don't use it at all because it's too wet. You need to wait for the ground to dry out. You need to go with a shovel and dig a hole and see what you're doing. But normally if the soil is dry and friable, all those pieces fall together and you may only have this once every third year. But you 
figure out what fields you're going to do to fix this, and you only do it once every three years. But the deep zone till shatters out that compacted layer, letting the roots go down. Uh, it also, because we're not disturbing the earthworms, the earthworm holes go down and add more air and water movement to the profile. And then leaving residue on the surface in between protects those air holes from the earthworms, uh, for the earthworms, so the air and water can move uh, up and down. And then we drive on the area in between that's still firm, so we're not packing it. Now, I did have a case where we did exactly that. It worked nice until we had three inches of water in about a half hour. And that three inches, uh, instead of being absorbed in between here, see normally what happens is that water will go in. If you have residue here, uh, it will go in all of this area and absorb it. So it holds that water. Uh, in this case, we had a compacted layer at the surface and all three inches only went into the center and made it literally filled with water and went completely anaerobic on us. So stuff does happen when you're out there. Looking at this field here, this was compacted. You can see the roots are all at a six to seven inch layer. Uh, it's not a really good picture on the right here, but at a 17 inch layer, the corn roots went straight down and those roots went 17 inches and it looked like a fox's tail. There was tremendous amount of root uh, hairs on that uh, plant. This is that earlier picture I showed you where we had the shovel. Uh, this here was broken apart, uh, but it broke at the compacted layer. Right next to it, we had gone through with the deep zone tillage, uh, broke it up. We had tremendous difference in root growth. The, field, the row on the right, the farmer said, as I went down combining, I went down and back and I had a full load. The stuff on the left was planted, planted two weeks later. He says, I went down to the end of the field and I had to drive back on the road. The bin was filled already. That was the difference in the yield by letting his roots go deeper. And here you could see those roots all over in there. The other thing that happens when you increase the rooting depth, I had a farmer that had a lot of heavy soils. And he got this because it was dry. He wanted more rooting depth for more water. And he said, on my heavier soils, it actually helps me more in wet years than in dry years. Uh, this is a heavy soil. We had a heavy rain. Where we had deep till, there was liquid water in the bottom of that slot. The water drained down. It left the surface aerobic. If it goes anaerobic, the settling builds up in corn, and the corn will not photosynthesize effectively for two weeks until it burns out of settling out of the system. But where we have excessive water in there, the water goes to the bottom, the stop spit, the top stays aerated, and kept on growing. He said, I gain more yield in wet years than dry years. And here you can see where they had deep tilled versus not. As soon as we got over it, the crop grew better. Uh, and this is the, the ears that were there. Now, it's not magic. Uh, in a good year, no matter what you do, you're going to get a good crop. But it's the shoulders where it helps. Uh, if it's drier than normal or wetter than normal, that's where the yields hold up and the yields continue. You may have had a good year, but in that low spot in the field, what was going on there? Or at the knoll, what was going on? So by having the tillage open up the rooting depth, you are now increasing the yield potential from your fields. And here's a field that goes 15 inches deep. Uh, a place that we have used this is in uh, winter forages. We make one pass through, we come in uh, and we plant and it works really well. At this point, I had a few other slides, but I'm gonna stop here, Aaron. Uh, because we're past time, I uh, wanted to see if there was any questions. I'll stop it at this. Okay, so Tom, can you you can hear me? Ask. Tom? Yep. Okay, so we did have a couple questions in the chat. Um, so uh, Liz Camp said, "I am so glad you mentioned the compaction in sandy soils. Long Island has that problem, and a lot of people don't believe it. Glad to see research on the topic. So there you go. There's some praise. 
And then we had, what's the difference in infiltration rate between 200 and 300 PSI uh, or resistance? All right. Um, I was just looking through to see if I could see it. Okay, so they're looking at 200 versus 300 PSI uh, infiltration. A huge part of infiltration is the top half inch. Go back to what Kirsten was saying this morning with her covers, leaving residue on the surface, that helps infiltration. But how far does that infiltration go before the soil gets anaerobic? Uh, I had a field actually that for every first picture I showed you with the narrow roots there, uh, that uh, field I had done some work with uh, in uh, the 1990s and they had moldboard plowed it, planted the corn. There was no roots below three inches because the water infiltrated, hit that pan, build up a perched water table, went anaerobic and rotted all the corn roots off at the three inch layer. Uh, so infiltration is hugely driven by what is on your surface right now. And then it's driven by how much water can go into the ground afterwards. 